the warmest of greetings to you. I am your storyteller, Chip. And you know, some storytellers will tell you that so-and-so was the kindest person alive and expect you to just believe them. But when I tell you that the fisherman called Urashima was the kindest person alive, I can actually prove it. Once, there was a time when Urashima went to the beach and saw some children teasing a turtle. Well, Urashima bought a ball for the children to play with, while he took the turtle to the sea. So you see, everyone was happy. The children with their ball, the turtle back in the sea. Urashima really was super kind. But remember, Every story needs something bad to happen, even to someone as kind as Urashima. For Urashima, most days were the same. He would go down to the beach in his little wagon, bring out his boat and go rowing out into the sea, ready to catch some fish. Because that's what fishermen do. And after he had caught plenty of fish, he would row back to the shore, put the fish onto his wagon and head off to the market, where he would sell the fish to get some money. And because he was so kind, he didn't keep that money for himself. He used it to buy vegetables for his parents, some toys for the children on his street, and even some medicine for his elderly next door neighbor. Pretty much every day it was like that for Hiroshima, taking the wagon down to the beach, rowing out into the sea, catching plenty of fish, rowing back, putting the fish onto his wagon, going off to the market and getting lots of money to buy vegetables for his parents, toys for the children on his street and medicine for his elderly next door neighbor. But the start of this story was not like an ordinary day. Yes, Urashima took his wagon to the beach and went rowing out into the sea. But as he got ready to cast his nets into the water, the waves began to get higher and higher and the wind was blowing tremendously. Urashima held onto the boat and well, you might be able to imagine what it's like rocking from side to side and, and almost getting tipped out of the boat. Urashima held on tightly hoping that he was going to survive when snap his boat split in two and Urashima was so surprised he found himself under the water. He was desperately trying to get back up to the top, trying to get some breath as well because he needed to breathe. Oh, can you imagine what it's like not being able to breathe? Desperately trying to swim to the top, kicking his feet, kicking his feet. <gasps> and then suddenly he was standing above the waves on a little island that had appeared. Now, there was something unusual about that. The storm was still going, the, the waves were still crashing around him, the wind was still blowing really hard. Where had this little island come from? Hiroshima looked down at his feet and saw two amazing things at once. First, this was the biggest turtle he had ever seen. He was standing on the shell of a giant turtle. But not only that, this turtle had saved his life. It had come up and saved his life. It was a giant life-saving turtle. But what happened next, believe it or not, was even more amazing. The turtle looked around at Hiroshima and said, Konnichiwa, Hiroshima! You saved my daughter the other week, so now I am saving you. Hiroshima couldn't believe it. It was a giant, life-saving, talk 
fucking turtle. Hiroshima didn't know what to say other than Konnichiwa, turtle, hello. Uh, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you for saving my life. Can you take me back to the shore? But the turtle said, We can't go just yet. The waves are still too choppy. How about I take you to show you the wonders underneath the sea while we wait? Well, Hiroshima thought this was a lovely offer, but he said, Sorry, turtle, I cannot breathe underwater. And the turtle replied, You cannot usually breathe underwater, true, but this is not a usual day, is it? Do you usually talk to a giant life saving turtle? Hiroshima had to admit the turtle did have a good point. So he held on to the turtle's shell as the turtle plunged underneath the water. For a while, Hiroshima held his eyes closed because he didn't really know what to expect. And it was so weird feeling all of the water going up his nose and around his mouth. But when he couldn't take it any longer, he breathed in and found he could actually breathe. And now, with his eyes open, he saw so many amazing wonders around him. He saw fish fluttering past like clouds of colourful confetti and giant manta rays swimming past with waving fins like, like birds flying in slow motion. And there were plenty of plants too, with such vibrant colours. Bright greens and pinks and oranges. It was dazzling. C can you think of some of the creatures under the sea? Hiroshima had never seen any creatures under the sea before, because remember, in those days, they didn't have television or anything like that. But you maybe know something under the sea, like maybe an, an octopus or some type of fish, like a shark with, with one of its long noses, maybe a hammer shark with one of its hammer-shaped noses. If you want to, you could have a go perhaps of making your body into the shape of something under the sea, so that as Hiroshima opens his eyes and looks out and sees what you're trying to be, he will give a great big wow. Shall we try it? Wow! Hiroshima was so amazed. He thought this had to be one of the best days of his life. But remember, every story needs something bad to happen. Even to someone as kind as Hiroshima. The turtle looked back round at Hiroshima and said, I know, while you're here, let me take you to the Dragon Palace to see the king and the princess. Well, Hiroshima was quite excited by this idea. He was just a fisherman. The idea of seeing a king and a princess was just blowing his mind. But for it to be an underwater king, and princess, the sea king and the sea princess. This was the most amazing thing ever. He was a little bit worried that he needed to get back so that he could get the vegetables for his parents and the toys for the children and the medicine for his next door neighbor. But surely they would want him to go and see the sea king and the sea princess, wouldn't they? So he held on to the turtle as they raced through the water. And as they raced, in the distance, Hiroshima saw what looked like a lizard's head. But as they got closer, it got bigger and bigger and bigger until he realized this was not a lizard at all. It was a palace, the biggest palace Hiroshima could ever have imagined. There were jewels in all of the walls. 
And as the turtles swam through the gates, even more wonders were there for Hiroshima to see. There were guards. There were lobsters being guards, standing there on two of their legs and holding a sword in all of their other arms and their claws. There were mer people, men and women with the tails of fish, playing beautiful music using shells. And there were seahorses bobbing along, carrying underwater candles. Yep, you heard me right. Underwater candles. Candles that were actually working underwater. But even though all of this was amazing and wonderful, nothing was as amazing as the smile that Hiroshima saw on the sea princess face. When she looked at him, she looked so radiant. Hiroshima had never seen anything so beautiful. He slid off the turtle's shell as the turtle said, Your Majesty, may I present the fisherman Hiroshima, who saved my daughter's life the other week. Hiroshima didn't know what to do, so, so he bowed as well. And the sea king looked down from his huge throne and said, Welcome, Hiroshima. We are so happy to have a kind fisherman like you here in the Dragon Palace. Please join us for dinner tonight. Well, Hiroshima had never had such a wonderful invitation. He was a little bit nervous about staying for dinner. He, he knew he needed to get back. He needed to get the vegetables for his parents and the toys for the children. And of course, the medicine for his elderly next door neighbor. But he was sure all of his family and friends would want him to accept an invitation, especially an invitation from a sea king. They would love to hear the stories he would have to tell afterwards. So, Hiroshima said, Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. I will be honored. And for the rest of that day, Hiroshima had so much fun. He sang songs with the mer people. He played games with the seahorses. And then he danced with the sea princess. She was so gorgeous. Hiroshima loved waltzing around the dragon palace with her. Hiroshima felt like he might be starting to fall in love. But remember, every story needs something bad to happen, even to someone as kind as Hiroshima. Well, all of this singing and playing and dancing had made Hiroshima very hungry, so he was really looking forward to dinner. And what a feast it was. Hiroshima had never seen food so colorful. There were sea fruits and sea vegetables and mm, they were delicious. They were, they were scrumptious. They were, mm, I'm running out of adjectives to describe how tasty they were. Hiroshima had never had such an enjoyable meal before. But with all of the fun, and all of that food inside of him, Hiroshima was now very tired, way too tired to journey back home. So the Sea King asked some sea lions to prepare a bed for him right there in the Dragon Palace. And Hiroshima spent that night in the underwater palace. The following morning, he was treated to a lovely breakfast. And while he waited for his food to go down, the seahorses asked if he would like to play, and some of the mer people invited him to sing. And after he'd finished with them, the sea princess invited him to dance. <laughs> and well, he couldn't say no to her. Once again, he danced with the sea princess for the best part of the afternoon. He really did feel like he was falling in love. And at the end of all of this playing and singing and dancing, Hiroshima was again very hungry, so he stayed for yet another fabulous feast 
really delicious and scrumptious and all sorts of other words as well. And at the end of that feast, Hiroshima again felt very tired, so he stayed for one more night there in the Dragon Palace. Well, those days turned into weeks, and those weeks turned into months. And after a month had gone by, the sea princess was dancing with Hiroshima one night when she asked him to marry her. Well, of course, that would make Hiroshima a sea prince. It was like all of his wildest dreams had come true, dreams he didn't even know he'd had. Hiroshima was so happy to say yes and become a sea prince there in that underwater kingdom. It was like he was the happiest he'd ever been, but he, he couldn't quite be perfectly happy. Every time they went to bed, he would always get into the bedroom and sigh really deeply. <sighs> and after a while, the sea princess asked Hiroshima, what is the matter, my love? Do you, do you not care for me anymore? And Hiroshima replied, oh, please do not think that, my, my darling. I, I am just so very worried about my family and my friends. I, I haven't seen them in such a long time and I miss them and I wonder if they miss me. How are my parents doing without me to get their vegetables? And the children in the street without me to get their toys? Or my elderly next door neighbor without me to get her medicine? The sea princess looked very sad at this. And she said, I understand you want to go back and see your family and friends. I cannot go with you, for if I go above the water, I will die. But if you really must go, please take this. And she handed Hiroshima a small jewelry box. Hiroshima was just about to look inside when she clapped it shut and said, never, ever open it. If you take this jewelry box to the water, you will be able to come back. But if you open this jewelry box at any time, it will be as if you've never been here. You will forget everything, including me. Well, Hiroshima thanked his beloved wife ever so much. This was the dearest present she had ever given him. And he promised that he was not going to open it. He would come back to her. Well, the following day, even before breakfast, Hiroshima got back onto the shell of that giant turtle to be carried swiftly through the water back to his homeland of Japan. And as they went, Hiroshima was getting more and more excited. He was so happy to be going to visit his family and friends again. When they got close enough for him to be able to slide off the turtle and put his feet onto the sand with his head above the water, he kept hold of the jewelry box from the princess, knowing he would use this to let the turtle know when he was ready to come back. And he started rushing through the water, even more excited now. I mean, can you imagine being away from your family and friends so long and wanting to give them a big hug and, and knowing very soon you're going to give them a big hug? That was how happy Hiroshima was feeling in that moment. But remember, every story needs something bad to happen even to someone as kind as Hiroshima. And indeed, as Hiroshima got closer to the shore of Japan, he began to think something 
very bad had happened indeed. All of the trees that used to be on the other side of the beach were gone. And instead, in their place, were huge, towering blocks of some kind of stone. Well, it was actually brick. But Hiroshima had never seen bricks before. He'd never seen blocks of flats before. He had no idea what these were, and he was starting to get nervous. He looked for where he had last left his wagon. But as he went over to that corner of the beach, he was amazed to see other wagons shooting by. Metal wagons that, that didn't have anything pulling them, but seemed to be going at super fast speeds and making this, this really loud noise as they went. Well, of course, Hiroshima had never seen a car before. He had no idea that's what these wagons were. And he couldn't find his own wagon. He was starting to get very, very scared now. But then he heard a terrifying roar coming from above. And as he looked up, he saw a ginormous metal bird shooting through the sky. And as Hiroshima looked up, he saw windows in the side of this bird. And it looked like there were little wheels coming out the bottom. And well, I'm. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you what that was. It wasn't actually a metal bird. But Hiroshima had never seen an aeroplane before. He had no idea what he was seeing. And now Hiroshima was terrified. As quick as he could, he, he rushed to find the street where he used to live with his parents and, and the children on the street and his elderly next door neighbor. But all of those houses were gone. In their place were yet more of those towering blocks. And Hiroshima saw a man selling newspapers by the side of the street. Hiroshima had never seen a newspaper before, so he, he didn't know that's what they were. But he went over to the man, because he looked friendly enough, and he said to him, uh, Excuse me, uh, but do you know where I can find the family of, of Hiroshima? Well, the newspaper man looked at Hiroshima, thinking he he seemed very strange. He was he was wearing very old clothes. Not old as in falling apart. They they were they almost looked new, but they looked like the sort of thing people would wear in well ancient times. And the newspaper man said uh, Hiroshima, I, I I don't know any oh well actually um uh, there was a story about uh, a man called Hiroshima, um, a very kind fisherman, I believe, who, who went out one day and, and disappeared in a storm. It made his family very sad and his friends as well. And many of them went all the way over to the other side of Japan because they, they didn't want to be in this area anymore. It brought back too many bad memories. But but that was a very long time ago. They're, they'll all be dead now. Hiroshima couldn't believe his ears. All, all dead? Even the children? That made the newspaper man even more confused. And he said, Children? <laughs> well, if there were children, they, they wouldn't be children anymore. I mean, this was 700 years ago. <laughs> Seven hundred years ago. Hiroshima thought that couldn't be right, because if, if the man was correct, well, then he would have to be 700 years old, too. He hadn't been under the water for that long, had he? Hiroshima's mind was starting to race. The... The world looked so different now. People were walking by with different clothes that looked brighter and, and they had words and pictures on them and, and they were so flat. 
and of course all around him were these towering blocks and these whizzing wagons and, and flying metal birds and... Hiroshima began to panic. He thought he, he, his mind was just not able to, to take all of these new sights and sounds. He, he needed to make some space in his brain. And that was when he felt in his pocket the jewellery box from the sea princess. He remembered what she'd said about how if he ever opened it up, it would be like he had never even met her. All of his memories would go. And right now, Hiroshima felt that's what he needed. He needed his mind to be clear of all thoughts, all memories. He opened up the jewellery box and a little puff of purple smoke went up into the air. And suddenly, Hiroshima had no idea where he was. Or who he was. But he saw that there was a newspaper man standing next to him, so he said, Excuse me, uh, what do you think I should do now? And the newspaper man, totally, thoroughly baffled now, said, uh, Would you like a job selling newspapers? And many miles away, under the sea, the sea princess was looking out of her window and she noticed a little puff of purple smoke floating by. And she knew that Hiroshima was not coming back to her. A little tear went out from her eye and joined all the water of the ocean. But she also had a little smile for Hiroshima, knowing that at least now he would be happy because he didn't have any worries to remember anymore. Thank you so much for sharing the story of Hiroshima with me. It really is one of my favorites, but I'd love to know what you thought. Please look for where it says review and follow the links to tell me what you thought. I'd love to hear from you. While you're there though, why not also check out my epic challenge? If you send me some of your creations, pictures, words, videos, who knows, I may well jump on a video call to say thank you to you in person. If you're an epic explorer, you can now enjoy a bonus story about another boy who wants to go on a time-traveling adventure, even though the time machine turns everything that goes inside into dust. You won't want to miss it, but if you're not an epic explorer yet and you'd like to know how to be one, head to fablespodcast.co.uk. Right now, though, it only remains for me to say cheerio, and I hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio, and I hope to hear your story soon. <laughs>